the topic of this last part of the lecture, so today, the first and the second hour, is to give you a glimpse about what is the state of the art in terms of analog simulation of lattice gauge theories. Okay? And we will do that. Yesterday we have seen more or less what the generic, generic theory is in terms of the various implementation strategies. Today we will see examples from both theory and experiments. Okay? So the outline is the following. So first, uh, I've tried to divide the, this kind of implementation based on, on the platform. Okay? So the first part will be dealing with what are so-called Rydberg atom systems. And first, I will give you a short introduction of what these platforms are actually capable of, and how are they, what is the microscopic degrees of freedom at play, and what are the resulting interactions. And I will try to give you an argument of why these are actually some of the best platforms to study gauge theories, okay? at least in the billion case. And then we will see two examples. The first are essentially U1 gauge theories in one dimension, so versions of the Schwinger model that we have seen yesterday. And we will see both the implementation and some phenomena. In particular, the phenomenon that I'm focusing on is so-called stream breaking. Okay? And the second example that I will be discussing are instead easing gigs theories in two dimensions. So theories that there are both, well, there is both matter and gauge fields, but the matter is actually bosonic. That's why the word X. In the second part, we will instead move into cold atoms in optical lattices that we have already seen at the beginning of our lectures in the context of these bose abbar models. What I would like to uh, present you is first a strategy, which I find very elegant to uh, realize Schwinger models via what are so-called spin-exchanging collisions. No? And uh, this is a particular strategy where you're essentially mapping the dynamics that you get out of angular momentum conservation into a gauge theory. Then we will see, instead, a more standard implementation based on energy constraints. And then finally, if time allows, I will move to non-abelian models that we have not really seen so far. And I will discuss strategies to realize those utilizing alkaline and earth act atoms, as I was promise you, promising you the first day. Okay. So, quick intro on Rydberg atoms. Okay. So, let me give you okay, a theorist viewpoint of what these Rydberg atom systems are actually about. Okay. So, Rydberg atoms, you can see them as atoms. So, if you take, for instance, hydrogen, and you look at the corresponding energy spectrum, here you have ionization, so this is a continuum. And here instead you have atomic spectrum, which is dictated by the principal quantum number n and by other, by other, uh, other variables that for a moment are not important to us. Okay? When this quantum number becomes large, say, and larger than 30, for typical experiments this is of order 50, 200. What is happening is that the wave function of your atom becomes closer and closer to the one of an ion plus an electron. And the reason is the following is that the atom, as uh, for instance, think about hydrogen again, there is a positive charge nucleus and then there is an electron traveling around. Okay? For these Rydberg atoms, the electron is traveling around at such a large distances that this becomes essentially a huge dipole, and these distances are, are of order of uh, nanometers. Okay? So huge. It can even be larger. Okay? So the atom acquires uh, a dipole moment in the presence of an external field, which leads to huge interactions. And these are some examples of our really concrete numbers that you have here for rubidium 87. For a, for, a, for a state which is 43s. So here, the, life, uh, uh, the, the radius of this atom is of order uh, hundreds of nanometers even. And of course, there is another problem, another quantity that I've not discussed, is that since these are now excited states, they can actually decay down to the ground state. Okay? There will be lifetime tau. And to give you an idea, for this state here, the lifetime is of order of 100 milliseconds. What is actually interesting is that the more the atom is excited, 
the longer the lifetime is, okay, which is a bit counterintuitive because you say it's as distant as possible to the ground state, but exactly because it's very far from the ground state, the matrix elements for it to decay are actually very, very small. Okay? Now, what is nice about these atoms is that their interactions are huge. Okay? Because since they are now dipoles of relatively large size, they interact very strongly at, at, at distance. Okay? And for instance, you see here an example there. If you trap two atoms at a distance which is of order of a micron, or in this case, yeah, one micron, so, or even larger, you can get interactions which are very, very strong. Okay? The mutual interactions between these atoms, V, can be of order of hundreds of kilohertz to even megahertz, depends on the state. Okay. Now, do you know what is the conversion between hertz and temperature? No? Okay, this is a very important number. 21 kilohertz. This is one micro Kelvin. Okay? So these interactions are of the order of tens to hundreds of microkelvins, okay? which implies that you don't have to cool these systems too much to actually see very sizable interactions. And you don't have to go to temperatures. So the typical temperature for Bose-Einstein condensation, for instance, it's of order of 100 nanokelvin. You don't need that. These interactions are much, much stronger than that. So you can allow your system to be cooled to relatively higher temperatures. Hmm? And now, in the next slide, what I would like to show you is that these huge interactions in specific regimes, they're actually perfect to realize gauge theories. Remember, for us, what are gauge theories? These are theories where the Hilbert space is constrained. OK? So this is the, the key point. OK? Why is this good? And, and the reason why it's good is, is a phenomenon which is so-called Rydberg blockade okay, that you see illustrated here. Okay. Imagine that you take a single atom, and the single atom has a ground state and a Rydberg state, and then you shine light to this Rydberg state, which, is, which has a rabbi frequency omega and is slightly detuned with a small detuning delta. Okay. Now, for a, single re, re, for a single atom, the Hamiltonian is very simple. One atom. You can write this as a, as a spin system where the ground state is equal to our spin down and the Rydberg state is equal to our spin up. And then the, the co corresponding Hamiltonian will be sigma, sigma x times omega plus delta times sigma z up to some constants. Okay? So this is really the Hamiltonian of a single Rydberg atom. Now, what, what is interesting is what is happening when you put two atoms together. And this is described by this energy diagram. Okay. This energy diagram tells us what is the energy of various states configuration as a function of distance. Now, I will try to reproduce it also here on the blackboard, because sometimes it's not clear. So this is the distance r, and this is the energy. If the two atoms are very from, far from each other, their energy is constant. Okay, you see the effective potential between Rydberg and Rydberg is actually not, not completely flat. And the reason is the following, is that I can just excite one state with the, by absorbing uh, one photon and then another state by absorbing the other. Okay? So if we, if we, are, we have the GG state and here we have the Rydberg and Rydberg states, okay, this GG is always flat. And this Rydberg, at very long distances, is also flat. Okay. And here, instead, you have also other two states, which are the one where we have Rydberg and ground state, and the ground state or Rydberg, they are also in the middle. And this energy cost here is the one that we have defined there, delta. Okay. This is delta, and this is another delta. This is also something which is constant, because it doesn't really matter huh? what is happening. The interesting thing is when we try to put two Rydberg atoms too close to each other. Okay? So you see, there will be a distance that in this plot is described by Rb. 
And at this distance, you start feeling the interaction between readable atoms. So what is the functional form of this interaction? For most practical purposes, these interactions as a function of distance will decay like a van der Waals. Okay? Even if at very short distances, this is, you should keep in mind that this is not always true. At short distances, the behavior can be also a bit different. Okay? But for our purpose, we will assume that the potential is of this type, which is actually natural because here we have essentially oscillating dipoles. Now, what is happening now is that this interaction is very, very, sh very small at large distances, but then at short distances, it shoots up like crazy. Okay? So having two atoms in the Riebel state is something that costs a lot of energy. And at some point, it screws up. Okay? And now, this implies the following, that if we start our dynamics in a state which is GG, and then we switch on omega, we can easily absorb one photon, and have a transition to this state. But then this guy cannot, cannot uh, absorb another photon because the, the corresponding state has very high energy. So this double process is actually inhibited. If you, if you perform this experiment, as a, for instance, as a function of time, and you track the populations of the various states, P, uh, GG, uh, and uh, for instance, P, G, R, and P, R, R. What you have is that as a function of time, P, G, G will just go down. Then we'll undergo a variable oscillation. P, G, R, this is P, G, G. P, G, R will increase. But PRR will essentially always stay zero. You will never realize a state which has two readable atoms excited. Okay? And this is happening at the distance, say, for every distance which is smaller than RB. Huh? This diagram is true for R smaller than RB. It's called blockade radius. Any questions on this? No? Okay. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, RB <coughs> depends fundamentally on this C6. So this implies that actually you can tune it a lot, because the, the coefficients of this dipole dipole interaction depends on the principal quantum number. It does also depend, well it depends on many things. It depends on the principal quantum number. It depends on the, on the specific uh, angles at which your, your states are taken if you, are not, if you don't have an S state. Because for instance, for Rydberg S states, the electrons is essentially living on a sphere, but you have also P states where the electron is actually working on a manifold which is very strongly anisotropic, and then this will depend on angles, theta and phi. Can also depend on other parameters, but these are the main, main dependencies. So it's very highly tunable. You can have systems where you have a strong blockade in one direction and no blockade on the other. Okay. Um, so this is an example, where instead of having two atoms, we now have many. Okay? And you can see what happens uh, for these atoms on the square lattice. If the, if the radius is square root of two, you're essentially blocking all the atoms which are nearest neighbor, tac, 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 and also next nearest neighbor. Okay? What is that? This is an Hilbert space which is strongly constrained. Okay? So this is exactly the thing that can help us realizing the basic building block of our gauge theories. Okay? 
Now, I'm actually going, o going over uh, uh, some more details of these systems that are important, and maybe we can discuss them later on, but I wanted to convey this message. This is really an ideal ingredient, this little blockade, to realize gauge theories. And this, of course, people uh, have noticed since the very beginning, and I think the, the guys that should take the credit, it's... Uh, uh, are, are in particular displayed by Luca Tagliacozzo, Alessio Celi, Maciek Leverstein, and co-workers. It's really one of the first to point this out. In digital, in analog, there has been several works. There has been also an experiment, and I will discuss it later on. Uh, and also there has been analog results in more than one dimension, uh, several ones, and also experiments. Okay? So this is, I will say, in terms of gauge theory, is the platform that, al that has allowed to see more physical phenomena so far, okay, at large scales. Uh, now, let me tell you about the first example. So this is 1D analog, and is the, about the Schwinger model. Okay, the Schwinger model we have already seen yesterday, uh, is, uh, is described by this Lagrangian, is just describing electrons and positrons coupled to an electric field, the magnetic field is not there. Uh, and it's something that I briefly mentioned yesterday is, is great. Is a is great uh, model, toy model, to understand certain features of QCD. And then in particular, one feature, which is stream breaking. Okay? And now let me depict it with a very simple animation. So suppose that you have an electron and a positron. An electron and a positron in one dimension. I mean, the two have to be connected by a flux string. Okay? Now, what you can try to do, very qualitative level, you can try to pull them apart. Okay? And if you do that, the flux string contains a larger energy because it's, I mean, you pay more and more cost. The electric field is, is different from zero in a large region of space. And at some point, you pull, it, they pull, you pull them so far that it's actually more convenient for the string to break. And then if the string breaks, you have to create a particle-antiparticle pair. Okay, you create here a, po a positron and here an electron, and you generate two bound states of electrons and positron. So these are called mesons. Okay. Oops. Tuck, 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 tuck. Okay. So this is a very basic phenomenon that appears in many theories. Okay. Here I've just illustrated it in the context of a very classical example. There are also uh, more convoluted ones. Okay? And let me tell you that this is not something that is just for fun. Okay? Actually, this is a very important phenomenon. And this is an example of a work taken from a work by Jürgen Berges and colleagues and, uh, uh, at the University of Heidelberg on the Schwinger model in one dimension where they study the stream, uh, stream breaking or string oscillations. And here what they are plotting is, uh, is uh, the the value of the electric field as a function of time over a large string after a quantum quench. And initially, the, the electric field is large, then it goes down to zero. When it goes zero, the string breaks. Then it goes negative, so there is a flux inversion. And then it goes down to zero again. This is a double string breaking, and so on and so forth. Okay? The idea is that there are these interesting phenomena. We would like to see them in an analog quantum simulator. Okay? Yes. Uh, okay, here I, I mean something relatively... Okay, when I say meson, here oh, I'm somehow abusing of this word in the following sense, that these are just cartoon states. If, uh, the definition of a meson is not like this. It is you have to study the spectrum of the theory and found a state where there are two particles. Okay? If you want, this is just cartoons. Okay? Uh, what, I want to, what I want to, however, illustrate is this cartoon is actually meaningful in the following sense that it contains the basic feature of what a meson is, so the bound state of a particle and an antiparticle, of uh, two quarks, quarks in the sense of, 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 the, of the charge of, of U1, of course. Huh? And also, those effects can only occur when we have a uh, gauge theory of matter. And you must have matter, yeah. Okay. You must have, I mean, to have stream breaking in, in the form that we will be describing, you must have matter. Okay. Perfect, thanks. Cheers. More questions? Okay, so let me tell you how we do this. So, 
the idea is, of course, that we have to work with the, with the Schwinger model. And you have seen yesterday what it is about. Uh, and we will not be working with the Schwinger model with this Lyrical parallel transporters. We will use this quantum link formulation. And in this quantum link formulation, what we were doing, instead of having on the, on the bonds infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, we really had spins. Okay? So remember, our Hilbert space was such that here, we had spins, and we will use now spin one half, and here we will have our fermions. Hmm? Oops, sorry. Oh, yes, 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 we have seen this. Thank you. Okay. So that's the Hamiltonian that we wrote also yesterday. So we have a first term that describes the coupling between the matter and the, and the gauge fields. So it's a hopping that goes along with the spin flip. Then we have a mass term. And then we have the electric field term. Notice that for us, the electric field term will be a bit trivial because SZ square, what it is for a spin one half? It's a constant. OK? Uh, so we will have a term which is slightly different from that because this will be otherwise just too simple. And just. I mean, this would be a matter field interaction, mass term, electric field. And the basic dynamics, again, is the one described by this. These are diagonal terms. So if you have a configuration of this type and you tunnel one particle from one side to the other, you will flip the spin in the middle. Okay? Tuck. Okay? So this is our microscopic dynamics. This is the, w the, the, this is the thing that we want to realize. Now, how we do that? Again. Let us focus on the Hilbert space first. So, like we have done yesterday, the Hilbert space is given by Gauss law. And Gauss law for the spin one half, this we have not written up yesterday. OK, no, this is the same question that we have, that we, we have written yesterday, but then we work it out for, for the continuous variables. For spin one halves, the Hilbert space is like this. So if we have even sides, on the even sides in this language, then we have uh, positrons. And then if there is one particle there, there is no positron. You remember the staggered fermions. If there is a particle, when, when in the, in the positron side, there is nothing. If there is a hole, then there is an electron. Okay? So when there is here full, the gauge fields on the left and the right are the same. If it's, so they can be either pointing left or point, pointing right. Let, let me actually write it, because later we will need it. Even. So we have a term where the flux is like this. We can have the flux like this. And then instead, when we have a sink, so there is a hole here, we can go back to this Gauss law. And if there is a, if there is a hole, zero, for even sides, oops, sorry, here, there is again. Mm, wait, 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 wait. Plus. OK, this, I think, is again inverted, or what? what's going on here? You see, there is a side, uh, OK. I think these are odd and these are even, like we had yesterday, indeed. OK, sorry for that. <laughs> I keep missing up on, on a minus 1, OK? Then there is really a sink, OK? So when there is this positron, there is a sink. Then we can do the same one on the even sides. So sorry for the messing up of the notation. Here, we have the opposite. So if there is nothing. It is like having no particles, so the flux on the left and on the right has to be the same. Yes. Okay. And it can be, on, of course, on both directions. And instead, if we have one particle, gets get, this gets equal to 1, so there has to be a, a, a difference of the spin on the left and on the right. Okay. So there has to be a source. This is this is particle. This is a sink. And this is a source. Okay. okay. Now, <coughs> of course, if we want to do something like this, we have to study something which is based on one dimension. And what was nice is that actually, when we were studying this, we realized that there was, a, there was already an experiment 
happens. It was done in the group of, of Misha Lukin at Harvard. And in these experiments, what they had, they had trapped the atoms on a regular lattice, and each trap was a distinct optical tweezer. Okay? And these tweezers were at a distance of a few microns, so the atoms were strongly interacting. Uh, and here you see in this level scheme, while they don't have just a ground state and a Rydberg, they have to uh, use an intermediate state. The intermediate state is so far detuned that it's actually not, essentially not taking place into in the dynamics, so this is really described by a model at the single particle level, which is the one that we have written on the blackboard. Okay? And in particular, if you write down the full system of Hamiltonian, you can do the following. You can decide that you assign to this Rydberg states, the following labeling, if the atom is in the ground state, it's black, it's zero. If it's in the Rydberg state, it's yellow, and it's one. It's equivalent to a spin one-half. And if you write down the Hamiltonian, the first part is the same as we have written here on the board. And the second part is the, is the Hamiltonian due to interaction which is not written as sigma z, sigma z. It's really something where, which is different from zero only if the two atoms are in the Rydberg state. Okay? And this Vij generically has a form of this type. Okay? This type of experiments. Uh, in the limit where Vj, j plus one is much larger than omega, What is happening is essentially that you never, you cannot have two atoms on, on neighboring sides because of the Rydberg blo blockade, the phenomenon that we have discussed before. So the basic dynamics is given by this Hamiltonian applied on the subspace where we have this constraint, which nj, nj plus 1 is always equal to 0. Okay? So we have non-trivial dynamics, and we have a constraint. It is interesting, actually, that this model was first introduced in a paper in 2004 by Fendlis and Gupta Sachdev, was of, and in that context, it was actually not related to cold atoms at all. They were studying it because it had interesting connections with integrability and so our core statistical mechanics models in, in two dimensions, so on, so on and so forth. So this interest, I mean, if you see that citation of that paper, there were not many <laughs> until 2014, but then it was realized that this was actually very relevant for these experiments. I think it's really one of the pioneering works and also illustrates how Sometimes, really having far-fetched theory ideas can help be helpful for experiments on a much longer time scale. Now, any question on this model? Okay. If you want to write it in a slightly different manner, I have a question. Uh, yes. So, I mean. In this case, it's the nearest neighbor, right? So they can also do it for the next nearest neighbor. The constraint. Yeah. Yes. So, and how do they do it? Uh, okay. If you want to have a constraint which is beyond nearest neighbor, what you have to do, you have to di diminish the lattice spacing. But essentially, the constraint is set by this RB. Okay? For instance, if you have a system, oh, let me do it there. If you have a system where RB, is equal to one lattice spacing, then we have this constraint. But you can also make it in such a way that it is equal to two lattice spacings. Okay, for instance, you, de you decrease the distance between the tweezer. And then, this is really giving you a constraint where you have nj, nj plus 1 equal to 0, and nj, nj plus 2 also has to be equal to 0. Okay? And so on and so forth. They've actually done experiments with uh, relatively larger constraints. But at some point, you eat a bottleneck, because you cannot put these atoms too close to each other. Typically, for these optical tweezers, there are limitations of the fact that these are tweezers. So this can, you can maybe make it around one micron or so, but not much smaller. And there is also limitation due to the fact that when you go to really short distances, the interaction between the read bar atoms are actually not, descri are not described by this equation anymore. It's a very, very complicated uh, formula. Very complete set of set of formulas, which are due to the fact that you have multiple levels that you cannot you cannot uh, trace out of the dynamics anymore. Okay, so this is the fundamental limitation on why you cannot do arbitrary range constraints. Okay. More questions? 
No? Okay. So that's our static model. Uh, why is this related to a gauge theory at all? Okay. And the reason why it is related is given by this. Very, re well, relatively simple mapping. Okay. So these are the states given by the Rydberg. Remember, the Rydberg have this nearest neighbor constraint. So if I take a pair of atoms, they can be either one in the Rydberg, one in the ground state, both in the ground state or ground state Rydberg. The state where two atoms are both yellow is not allowed because of the Rydberg blockade. So the Hilbert space dimension of a bond for a Rydberg system is actually three. Three is the same Hilbert space dimension of these guys that we've written on the blackboard. Okay? So that's already a good sign. We can, we, it seems to be able to match one into the other. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so, and this you can do on, of course, even odd and on the even bonds. Okay? The Hilbert space dimension does not change. It's three here, it's three here, and it's three in both cases here. Now the question is, do the two descriptions match? This is the main thing. And this is more delicate, and I would like to illustrate it to you on, with this picture. Now, is it working? Yes. Yeah. But I cannot see it. Can you see the pointer? No. Oh, okay, now yes. Let's do it here. So here we have an atom which is yellow, and in this quantum link model, this yellow corresponds to the field pointing left, blue. So this is an odd even bond. And now we have to look at what is happening on the even odd bond. So we have to look at the, at the atoms on the right if they have the same description. And here we see the yellow corresponds to a blue. Good. And the black corresponds to red. Red, red, black, red, black, red. Okay? So this correspondence is, is working. Now we have to check the correspondence for the other atoms. Okay? These are this, this I, I should com uh, um, somehow match this column with this column here. And uh, on this column, we see that the yellow is not a blue anymore. The yellow is a red. Okay? And the black is blue. So I should now match it with this column, blue, sorry, uh, sorry, blue corresponds to black, blue corresponds to black, yellow corresponds to red. Yes, everything works. The mapping is one to one. Shall I repeat this? Yes, let me repeat it, okay? So let me use also another, another figure. So if you want, what we have to do, we have to match the Hilbert space of a system where we have actually two sites, okay? two consecutive sites. And we can take the first, let's take the first row, for example. Okay? The first row has something which we have. This is the odd even, and this is, of course, the even odd. The first row, we have the blue. Full site blue. And then the only way we, we can match it in two manners, actually. We can either choose the first line or the second line. Let us choose the second line, yeah? where we have a blue, empty, red. Blue, empty, red. Okay? So I've been combining the first line here with the first line here. Now we have to match whether the Rydberg also match. Okay? The Rydberg, the first one, is a big yellow. The second one is black. And then here, what we have is black, black. Okay, so black, it's okay, and black, it's okay. Fine, works. Okay. We could also have combined this state with what? What is the other option on, on the even odd? which has a link on the left, which is blue. It's the option where there is a full sight and a blue sight there. Okay. Full sight and a blue sight there. Okay. Well, of course, the corresponding representation here would be, this is full, this is black, uh, full and yellow, this is black, and then the third sight here, corresponding to this state, this state corresponds to this, the, the first one on the top right. This is now corresponding to a yellow. Fine, this is also working. 
The reason why it works is because here it's true that we have two readable excitations, but they are not the nearest neighbors. Okay? They are the next nearest neighbor. Hmm? And you can do this for all the possible combination of these nine states. Okay? And once you do it, you find out that actually there, there is a perfect correspondence. Okay? This is nice because it's telling us that the Hilbert space of our quantum link model is exactly equivalent to the Hilbert space of Rydberg atoms plus Rydberg blockade. Blockade at the nearest neighbor. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so you have allowed configurations in the Rydberg given the blockade, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have allowed configurations in the link model. Yes. And then like you're kind of essentially creating a mapping between like each of those configurations which are allowed at each kind of like matter yes. vertex. Yes. And uh, then you're showing that th this mapping is consistent in one to one. Yes. Okay, cool. This right. is very important. Yeah. Because if the mapping was for instance two to one, then you should have understood what is the, the degree of freedom that you are losing, yeah? Or, opposite, you can also try to build a mapping that actually works at the level of single site. But then if you match two sites, it doesn't work. Mm. And then it implies that the Hilbert space is not in the, I mean, there are additional problems. Mm. Okay? Here, the mapping is one-to-one. -one, it works. Everything is compatible. Okay? And it's actually local. So it's not really a, it's really a local mapping. Okay? Good. Uh, the advantage is that now with this mapping, we can also do some funky things and try to understand what is the correspondence, of the correspondence between the many body states that the Rydberg can actually realize and the states in the gauge theory. Uh, this is an example of a few states that I've picked up. The first state is an L state, which we'll see in the experiment is very important because they actually start the dynamics from this, okay? where there is a Rydberg atom, ground state, Rydberg, ground state, Rydberg, ground state, and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at the mapping here, what does this correspond to? I mean, here you have uh, Rydberg and ground. This corresponds to a state where there is a full site, so in this case, no particle, and then the flux pointing leftwards. And then you look at the other bond, even odd. There is a black yellow. Black yellow corresponds also to a full site where everything is flowing. Okay? Uh, I think there is a. Yeah, there is some small inconsistency here. This has to be, okay, yeah, fine. Doesn't matter. I mean, the site of the matter, we can forget about those. Look just at the site of the gauge fields. The site of the gauge fields are such that essentially we have a flux going fully in the left direction. Okay? So the null state is what we used to call is a so-called string state in one direction. Now we can look at the other null state. The one, instead of, instead of having yellow, black, we have black, yellow. This is a string state in the opposite direction. Okay? So flux moving from left to right. The state where there is no Rydberg excitation, I mean, is a state where essentially we have a continuous succession of, of uh, sinks, sources, sink sources, and so on and so forth. So this is inverted here, sorry. Okay. And this is equivalent to a state where we have po positron, and, um, uh, positron, electron, positron, electron, positron, electron, and so on and so forth. Okay. So it's a, it's a sea of electron-positron pairs. Okay. So that's the way we interpret these Rydberg states. Okay. Blackboard, OK, we have seen what it was about. Now we have to see whether the dynamics make sense, because just having the constraint is not sufficient. We need to also match the dynamics, which is described by the equation that we wrote at the beginning. Now you have seen I've, I slightly changed this equation. Instead of having the electric field square, which we have understood it's trivial for spin 1 half, I have put the electric field minus a constant square. This constant theta in the, in the context of Schwinger model is called uh, topological angle or theta angle. If you don't know what it is, don't care about it. I just wanted to mention this because first it appears in the description naturally and it's also something which is very important in condensed matter when you describe spin chains. Okay? You know, sigma models, they also have theta angles. Okay? Now we have to see whether this Hamiltonian is actually something which is mapped into, into the Rydberg dynamics or not. It's not guaranteed at all. Okay. Uh, some terms are easy to see. Okay. For instance, uh, let me see. 
If you have a term which is proportional to the electric field, this has to be something that maps into the position of the Rydberg atoms, the polarization. And indeed, if one does the map math right, you get that this term here maps into something which is a, st which is a detuning, which is position dependent. Notice that this was not realized in the experiments, okay? There, the detuning was actually space independent. The coefficient of this detuning theta is given by, uh, the delta is given by theta minus pi. So this implies that actually the experiments did not realize just the Schwinger model, realize the Schwinger model with a topological angle pi. Okay? <clears throat> then the mass term, instead, maps into something which is a constant thing, so it loses the, the staggering factor, which is exactly our detuning. So the detuning in the experiment corresponds to the mass of the electrons and the positrons. Finally, the, the weird term, which is a three-body term here, what does it correspond to? It corresponds to sigma x. And this you can see from these examples. Okay. Here, I need to have one other site, sorry. Here, if I act on this block with a term that, that does something like this, psi dagger i plus 1 as minus psi i, I'm essentially tunneling this particle from here to here. So the final state is something like this. And if we utilize this mapping, this final state corresponds to something where instead of having a yellow side, we actually have a black side. So this implies that the action of these terms has to be equal in the language of the spin model to something which is sigma plus. Of course, you have also the Hermitian conjugate, Hermitian conjugate plus Hermitian conjugate, so this is equal to sigma x. So this is the reason why, instead of having a very complicated three-body term now, we have a very simple local field. Okay. Of course, these dynamics here, we have put P. What is P? P is the projector given by the condition of the Rydberg blockade, okay. so, uh, which I've written there somewhere, uh, which I also canceled. So N i, N i plus 1 is has to be equal to 0. Okay. So that's the mapping. And now the idea, okay, first of all, what we have uh, we learned is that this experiment that Luke has performed is actually realizing the lattice finger model at a specific value of the topological angle. Okay? Now, let us try to use our gauge theory language to interpret what, what they have seen in the experiment. Okay? And in the, in the experiments, they've done the following. Okay, they have performed several measurements, but one measurement that was particularly interesting is this one. This is a quench dynamics, and in this quench dynamics, what they had done, let me illustrate it here on the blackboard. <coughs> they have started with a state which has the maximal number of Rydberg atoms possible. So a state where we have one Rydberg Empty, Rydberg, empty, Rydberg, empty. Okay? And then, that, that you can see it here is actually depicted by these uh, colors. This is a position of the atom in the cluster in the y direction. And if you, if you see yellow, there is a Rydberg atom. If you see black, there is nothing. So this is really a null state. Okay? Remember, what was a null state in our language of the gauge theory? It was a string pointing left. Okay? In the gauge theory, this was a string pointing left. And then what they've done, they have quenched the Hamiltonian. Tuck. Switch it on, and then this, this string melts. It becomes at some point everything, uh, a state where you see no atoms. And the state where you see no atoms, what was that in our gauge theory language? Proliferate uh, sources sink, sources sink. So a proliferation of particles and antiparticles. Okay. But then what is remarkable in the experiment is that at some point there is a revival. But in this revival, the Rydberg probability is not the same one as the beginning, but is in the, is in the opposite sub lattice. Okay? So instead of having one zero, one zero, one zero, you have zero, one, zero, one, zero. 
So what was the state in the gauge theory? It was the state with the flux in the opposite direction. This is, okay, we'll see later in the plot. I mean, this is what they've observed. And there has been actually a very interesting uh, discussion about these anomalous revivals in the context of uh, rare uh, st st states which break the state thermalization hypothesis, a very nice paper by the Zlatko Papic group in 2018, and then uh, many other works that have discussed this. This is not the point that I want to make now. Uh, we are really interested more in the field theory origin of that. Okay? And, uh, First of all, what is this? This is essentially string breaking. Okay? We have a string, the string disappears, and, it, and it's created in the opposite direction. If we were to, set, to pl plot the electric field as a function of time, for this state, the electric field will be maximal in one direction, for instance, positive. For the state here, it will be zero, no average electric field, and the here will be negative. Okay, so this is really stream breaking, what they've observed. And the idea is, can we try to understand from what is known about the Schinger model? Okay, this is a bit of a more theory uh, slide, but I would like to show it to you anyway. The Schinger model in the continuum limit maps into this field theory. Okay? The first part is uh, what is called Lattinger model. Then there is uh, a, line, uh, a square term in phi, which in Latinger language will be a mass, and then there is a cosine, so something very similar to a sine Gordon model with a, with a, with a topological angle theta, okay? That's what it is. And what is interesting is that this field theory is actually integrable in the massless limit, okay? So it's a theory that will also lack thermalization. Of course, here we are talking about continuum limit and here lattice, so it's a bit, one has to be careful. What, what we can use is, is still the interpretation of that. Okay, this is essentially the effective potential that you have when you have a large mass in the Schwinger model. It's a double well. And when you relax the mass, when you put the mass to zero, this double well becomes just a flat potential with a single minimum. But if you quench it, what is happening? Since this potential is quadratic, you will have persistent oscillations between the two possible states. And these states, this is the string, and this is the, the in one direction, this is a string in the other. So what is happening out of this is that what we can interpret this double well potential as a string state that is quenched and then oscillates between string and anti-string state continuously, or the two null states. Okay? That's the, the, the picture that we can get out of this simple field theory. And of course, this is very simplified because it will predict infinite oscillation forever, which is not happening. Okay? But it, it, it explains why there is the oscillation which are anomalously strong. Okay? So there is a, some field theory origin at the basis of, uh, of uh, what has been observed in the experiments. Let me also mention this is actually not unique to the Schwinger model. There are also other gauge theories where this has been seen. Okay, okay fine. I mean, we were... Uh, yes. So more on the experimental side. So what's the yeah. kind of fidelity that one gets? Uh, like uh, how pure is the state uh, during the dynamics and stuff like this mm -hmm. with these Rydberg simulators? Yeah. Uh, here they have not measured the, the purity of the full state. What they have done, they have done two things. First, uh, they have tried to match their observations with MPS simulations. Okay. Looking at, for instance, the value in the gauge theory, the value of the electric field, in their case, the river population. And this was within a few percent. So it implies that they had a good mapping. Notice that the, the, there is not only a problem of dissipation. Here there is also a problem of, of uh, really properly modeling uh, also local potentials and so on and so forth. Because these atoms, okay, are, they are cold, but sometimes they might have a bit of vibrational effects within, in, within the wells in that experiment. Okay? But this MPS was in very good agreement. Second thing, of course, you can measure experimentally the decay rate of a sing single river atom. And this was larger than the time scale that are described here. I mean, here you see the time scale are of order of a few microseconds. Hmm? And uh, this decay rate, I think, is, is a factor of, of 10 larger. So you will start seeing the effect of decay up there, okay? more or less. Assuming that the decay is only due to single particle effects, which is not guaranteed. You can also have... Uh, facilitated dissipation in the systems. But I don't think that's the case for that experiment. Yes. 
uh, as you wish. Uh, maybe yes. Uh, one question. This uh, interval field theory that you find, mm -hmm. uh, is it connected with the fact that for the PXP model, they were trying to explain these revivals also saying it's near an interval point, an, inter an interval model. Is it connected? No. It's true? No. Uh, it's a good question that you're making. No, I, I think there is no connection. Because the point that we are making is that there is really a field theory effect. So it's something that will not translate into the lattice. What this implies is that there are states on the lattice, which have a very mild continuum limit, that whose dynamics will be dictated by the field theory, but states which have no continuum limit and they will be not, not dictated by the field theory. So we are actually not saying anything about the lattice model being close to an integrable point. Then the question is, of course, how do you determine which states are described by a field theory and which one are not? <laughs> I think what is magical is that this state is the bare vacuum. It's a state where the field does not fluctuate at all on short distances. Is this a state which is good for a field theory? That's fantastic. It's the best state you can pick up because the field is zero everywhere. It's constant everywhere. So there is some sort of magic in, in what was done in this experiment. They have, picked, they have picked exactly the best possible state that is described by the field theory. If they were using a state where there was something like 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. This would have been a state which has been very rough here, and this would have not been discovered in field theory. But the one in between is very rough, or not? Okay, the one in between is very rough, but if you look at the electric field, it's also zero everywhere. <laughs> okay? Says that, okay, it's staggered, but up to a, a lower constant, it's actually zero everywhere. So this is also good. Some sort of magic. It's le of course, it's less good than that, because the matter field, so the charge is, is now changing at the level of a single lattice spacing, okay? Thank you. Cheers. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, does the vacua oscillations predicted by the bosonic theory, uh, the, peri the periodicity of these oscillations can be predicted from the field theory? No. You compare those? No. Cannot be predicted because if to predict it, you will have to have a control mapping between the continuum limit and the lattice model, which you, you, you can only have it at a critical point. And this is, of course, not talking about critical points. OK, yeah. thanks. Cheers. So by slow dynamics, you mean like that it's not thermalizing quickly? or Yes. Uh, OK. And then just to understand this field theory argument. So how can we assume that mass is equal to 0 for this case? Because I see that then like you, you, you start having like a single well and start oscillating and so and so. but like. Wasn't the parameter in the experiment like the mass term wasn't zero or? Uh? No, no, this. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, in the experiments, what they do? Okay, this value of m, which will be delta, will be finite. Mm. But the mass in the sine order is actually given by e square, which will be zero in the, in the quenched Hamiltonian. Here, there is a bit of ambiguity of what is the para mass parameter in the, in the, in the lattice dynamics and the, in the. In the Instead, in the, in the field theory, uh, maybe this uh, was not clear enough when I showed this. You see here, the, this value m is actually not the mass of the original model. Okay, this is the mass, uh, and it's not even the prefactor here. It's something which is given by that. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Okay. It's, really, it's very bad notation. So oh. how, yeah, how, how much of insight can we really extract from this field theory? Because, okay, uh -huh. I see... Well, we cannot predict the period. We mm -hmm. like we get some feeling that we get some kind of oscillations, but like, for instance, like would this double well picture give us anything like that? Th those oscillations have like you know what some two different frequencies. Or okay, like that. there is one thing that we can predict. Sorry, maybe maybe th this I can say. That of course we cannot predict from the field theory the mass, but in principle we can do a DMRG computation and compute the mass of the lattice model. Okay, that would be the mass if the lattice model would have a continuum limit, which it doesn't have at that point, the Hamiltonian. And then this mass is the one that describes actually the oscillations. So this we can do. But of course, to, one should be honest. This is not a prediction that comes from the field theory only. You have to input it, a computation that you do numerically on the lattice. Okay? This is important. I also have a question. So how yeah. much this mapping of to the field theory is precise Somehow it's confusing for me that uh -huh. we also know that, you know, uh, 
this field theory, sine Gordon field theory, is the dual to the Turing field theory, which has the four fermionic term. Yeah. And then you started actually with the Schwinger term, uh, yeah. you know, somehow. Yeah, but uh, look, I mean, yeah, you're right, of course. But uh, I mean, if you think about the, the theorem model or the sine Gordon model, there are many field theories that, done, that, that uh, there are many lattice models that are mapped into that. I mean, you can take uh, ex existing chain, you take the bose abbar model, fer fermionic abbar model. The Schwinger model in the quantum link is also falling into that. So in this respect, I don't, this is not an ambiguity. It's more that there are many models that have the same field theory descriptions. But in one dimension, this is common. Especially the field theory is what is called C equal to 1, CFT plus. So, so I would say this is. I mean, yes, but the point is that you know this mapping only between the continuum theories. So the, this, this field theory you get, and this was got by Coleman actually, when he solved the Schwinger model in the continuum without passing through the lattice. Okay? Well, of course, there is an additional passing for us that we have to go through, we, we are starting from the lattice, so to be more careful. But again, let me state, I'm, don't, I'm not telling you that the full spectrum of, of the lattice model is described by this. It's only a few states. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, that's this this part, and uh, the string dynamics correspond to. Uh, okay, sorry. Let me mention this. So the string dynamics that we have seen really correspond to this these low oscillations between the null states that were seen in the experiments. Okay? So this is really making a connection between very well-known phenomena in particle physics that people are actually still interested in studying, and studying continuously, and read the atom experiments. Now, the advantage of this is that now this is very generic, the correspondence that we have. And what we have done, just for fun, we have done simulations on the Rydberg model, on the quantum link, and already the Schwinger model in the Wilson formulation, and all of them display this anomalously long oscillation, so this stream breaking uh, as a function of, of the mass and uh, of the electric field value. Yeah. And uh, so this is really the same phenomenology, but I would like to show you that in principle now what you can do, you can also study slightly different things. Let me go to the next slide. Do you find more interest? Okay. Ah, it's here. You can try to do quenches, even both in the Rydberg and in the, in, the in the Schwinger theory, where you start putting defects. Okay. So this is a null state with a defect. And in the language of the Schinger model, this will be a uh, vacuum with a particle-antiparticle pair. And you see that this creates almost perfect wave fronts. This is another state which is a very good description of the continuum limit. It also does not decay. Okay? And in principle, you can even do more. You can do something that the particle physicists are interested in, which is scattering. Okay? Here, these are two examples where we have prepared. This is numerics. The experiment has not been done. Okay? Where we prepare cartoon states where we have a positron and an electron pair at two points in space. And then we let them evolve, and then you see that they scatter almost elastically. Okay? So of course, the, particle, the, the meson immediately blows up, unless the value of g squared is too strong. In this case, this is of order of 1, so it blows up immediately. And then, you see there are these oscillations, and what is interesting is they also become, come back in, in, uh, in phase, which we were not able to explain. It's just an observation. And in principle, you could do the same thing, thing with the Rydberg. And you will see that there's this persistent oscillation will be shifted by pi inside the cone of the meson. You see that these are shifted by pi with respect to this. And again, there will be almost perfectly elastic scattering. Here, the oscillations are still coherent. Yes? So just to confirm what's happening. So mm -hmm. um, when I see this wave front, like, mm. Does this correspond to just like particle antiparticle pair just like propagating? Yes. So okay, so this is just like a kind of like a string being created, uh, broken, uh, yeah, remade. yeah, broken, so remade, so and so on and so forth. Yes. Okay. Cool. If you want, you, you can see it easier here. This is a string of electric field that oscillates, and when it encounters the the wave front, there is somehow particle antiparticle pair created locally. It creates this time delay, and then uh, the shift is actually switched by power two. Okay, so this was, I mean, in our, uh, I think in our opinion, this is the, la oh, yeah. 
can can you see confinement if you change the position of the fact? Next slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because because uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Cheers. I did. I mean, this of course a question that was made on purpose. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here the, the idea is that can we try to distinguish whether there is a confinement mechanism or deconfinement in this model by doing the sequential dynamics or in some other way? And again, what is really confinement and deconfinement? It's something which tells us if we have two particles, we can separate them at arbitrary distance, deconfinement, where their energy cost is zero, or with confinement, we cannot separate them. Now, this depends on this topological angle. Somehow, for the topological angle pi, this is the only place in the sugar model which is deconfined. <laughs> okay? So in the experiments, they have reali realized this deconfined dynamics. Uh, and here are two examples of things. Of course, they have not done an evolution with a string state. Because in principle, to see that, you need, need to put a particle, antiparticle at a given distance, and the relative evolve. And these are the simulations for these states. This is a string that evolves as a function of time that you see when it's confined, the string does not evolve. Opposite, here, if you do the same simulation for the angle that was done in the experiments, the string will evolve and will actually at some point completely dissipate. Okay? Because you are able to, to separate a particle and an antiparticle at arbitrary distance. Okay? That will be a dynamical way of seeing confinement. Is it clear? Yeah. Okay. In very similar to? Okay. I mean, this phenomenon is not only unique to gauge theories. I mean, you can also see it in easy models. And there is a paper here by Mario Collura, uh, Pasquale Calabresi, and others that also had studied this. Okay? But what is nice is that now, in experiments, they could see it immediately, okay? if they were to do this. Yeah. Okay, let me really explain it. Confinement is, I create a particle and antiparticle, and then I let, I let them evolve, and actually they do not move because the energy cost to move them is too large. This you can see from the fact that here there is a string of electric field that is essentially constant. If this electric field is constant, it implies that these charges are there and they are not moving. Okay? And in the Rydberg, this will map into this. Okay. This, in, this is what you will see in the experiment because of our weird, weird mapping. But look at the electric field, it's clearer. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you, put, if you put a very small cost here, it will break and propagate. The simulation is done such this cost here is g squared is, is large, so this does not break. Here we have done the same simulation with the g star large, but now we have put a theta angle pi, which is in the experiment actually what is realized. And then we have put this string. This string here, it's a given distance, I don't know, six sides. Okay? And now you let the system evolve, and you see that immediately the electric field starts uh, becoming relatively large, also away, and positive also away from this point. So it implies that you have, you have been moving these charges more or less with the speed, of, with the corresponding speed of light, I mean the speed of, actually, better talk about speed of sound here, because there is a mass. Okay? And what you will see in the Rydberg is that your very nice uh, pattern, uh, and Nell pattern here will actually disappear and will not come back. Here will be completely blasted. At some point it's just a mess. And this will give you the difference between confinement and deconfinement, dynamically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, okay. I mean, if you have a theory with matter, at, uh, at some point, a string will always break. Because if the distance is too large, we'll have a break. Just the dynamics of it will be very slow. Okay? When you talk about confinement, this is the same thing. Uh, actually, if you try to move this particle at some point, like a string breaking, you will prefer to create particles in the middle, and that's it, and they will move. So, so here, if you look at very long times, the particles actually do move. Well, even in a confined theory. Is that the time scale for them to move is not a microscopic time scale, it's something which is perturbatively small. While here, there is no reason, I mean, the, the perturbation theory becomes immediately effective, okay? so you have an immediate propagation. So that's, the, that's why I, I think it has to be a bit, I mean, we're really talking here about confinement of excitations, so this has to be put in the proper context. 
uh, and this is also discussed in this work here, which is uh, something which not, does not immediately distinguish screening and confinement, to be honest. Okay? But that's kind of a separate discussion. Yes? <laughs> Very good. At the beginning, no. An initial state is a product state. But then you are asking if there are, uh, maybe I have a slide about this. No, I don't have it. Yes, it's an excellent question, actually. It's not guaranteed that they are entangled. Okay? Like it is, yesterday we have seen that there was entanglement because we could measure it. Here it's not guaranteed, but uh, okay, if you trust me, I tell you there is. The reason why I tell you that there is is that we have done tensor network simulation of very large systems where we either collide mesons or just look at particle antiparticle creation. And this always comes with a very large entanglement uh, in the Schinger model, so in all cases. But in experiment, we wouldn't know how really how to measure it in this thing. You have to do some complicated uh, protocols that know how easy that is. OK. So, so, so far, so good. Everything was about one dimension. Now we would like to move to 2D. And our motivation to move to 2D was actually very different. It really came more from condensed matter rather than, than, uh, than an energy. And in particular, we were interested in the states which are so-called quantum spill liquids. Okay? So these are states of matter which do not order even at zero temperature. So they are kind of paramagnets. There is no symmetry breaking. But they, uh, but they are uh, non-trivial in the sense that the correlations between these paramagnets, for instance, their entanglement can have signatures which are different from uh, typical paramagnets. Okay? So, and of course, this is a field that has had a very long history from cartoon states, uh, so numerical simulations, exactly soluble models. But it's, uh, it's also something where Experiments have not really been able to, to provide strong evidence of that in the context of solid state. And the question that one has is that, okay, can we use these synthetic quantum systems to realize some of these states? And of course, at this point, you can tell me, well, I mean, why are you talking about gauge theories at all? Well, the reason why I'm talking, we are talking about this in the context of gauge theories is because I think the modern understanding of these quantum speed liquids, that they are nothing but deconfined phases of some gauge theory. Okay, you can take this almost as a definition. Huh? And if there are many reviews. There is this nice by Savary imbalance, that's a, like particularly, and they discuss this perspective pretty much in detail. So, <coughs> sorry. So the question for us is, can we design an experiment, or can we understand an experiment that has been performed in the language of a gauge theory, which has the confinement? And... We started this by looking actually at, at the results of an experiment, again from, from, from Misha's group, uh, which was also preceded by some numerical experiments uh, reported in this work. And what they do here, they put the Rydberg atoms on this lattice. Okay? This lattice, it's called ruby lattice, and is made out of the bonds of a kagome lattice. Okay? How many of you have seen a kagome lattice before today? Okay, this is. How many of you seen, have seen? Uh, how many of you have, uh, have seen a ruby lattice before today? Okay, it's a kind of more exotic thing, okay? but you can see it really as the bonds of this uh, of this kagome. And they found uh, they have measured the expectation value of certain operators, whose details I will now not discuss. But the key uh, the key element here is that they, they claim in, in this work that they have realized a spill liquid. The question from our side is. Can we understand these experiments as the realization of a deconfined gauge theory? Okay. Can we analytically find a relation between what they've done and a gauge theory? That was our goal. So, Marcello, yes. what's the signature of the spin liquids in the experiment that they see? Which symmetry? Oh, the signature, what, 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 ah, what is the, sig uh, the signature? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's actually a good question. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think what, I mean, first of all, they, they see no order, okay? So the state is definitely a paramagnet. And then what they do, they measure what are so-called Fredenhagen-Marku order parameters. Okay, so let me 
l'ammettelio. Okay. So, since it's a paramagnet, if you want to see that it's non trivial, you cannot do that for, with local correlations. So, what they do? They take something which people in high energy uh, so have discussed in the past. Uh, for this, I need to tell you how to distinguish confinement and deconfinement. Okay? So if I have a gauge theory on whatever lattice, if you want to distinguish confinement from deconfinement, what you do, you, lo you take a, a loop in real space and imaginary time in your path integral, and this loop you call gamma. And you look at an operator which is called W of gamma, which is the product over all the loop of your parallel transporters. Okay? If, uh, so think about the Z2 gauge theory so that this thing is a bit simpler. Okay? This is called Wilson loop. And the Wilson loop distinguishes confinement and deconfinement in the following sense that if you plot this as a function of the perimeter, Uh, perimeter of the loop gamma. In a deconfined phase, this actually decays like the exponential of the perimeter itself. Perimeter of gamma times a function alpha. Okay? However, if the thing is confined, this actually de decreases much faster. It typically decays like minus the area of the loop. Okay? So this is the diagnostics that people will use in, in high energy physics when they do a Lagrangian simulation of a, of a lattice gauge theory. Now, the Wilson loop is good when there are no particles involved, no fermions, no Higgs. If you have fermions or Higgs, there is an adapted version, which is called Fredenhagen mark order parameter. Order parameter which does uh, the following. It does not take Wilson loops again. I mean, it takes, it takes a Wilson loop, but it also takes what, what is an open loop, okay? Square. Uh, yes, there probably is a, there is a square root of all of that. Okay, but th that's also fine, okay? And the, the expectation value of this uh, operator distinguishes between confinement and deconfinement. If this is of order 1, the theory is deconfined. If, if it's of order 0, the theory is confined. Okay? What is important in all of this is that you take stuff which is in real space and in imaginary time. So this path is never in real space only. Okay? And, uh, and as to also explore imaginary time, and the reason is simple, because since confinement is an energetic problem, when you move your path in imaginary time, you are, re you are resolving energies if you want. Of course, in the field theory, it doesn't really matter because it's, there is Lorentz invariance. But when you do a microscopic model, this might matter. And what uh, uh, they have done in these experiments, they have had a motiv somehow phenomenologically motivated version of the uh, Fredenhagen Marco, but in real space. So that was the measure. Th that's what they've measured. And this is of order one in the phase where they claim there is a spin liquid. But of course, then you have to ask yourself whether the real space is really meaningful. And this, I think, it's not clear. OK? OK, thank you. At least to me, it's not clear. Uh, what is this? time and uh, real space in that case? No, I mean, in their, fa in their case, oh, it does not, there is no mapping. Hmm. Actually, ma they have not done the imaginary time equivalent of the Friedemann and Marco. They've only measured the real real. But the real real, you know, you can move into, you can map into a real imaginary only if you have exact Lorentz invariance. Mm. If you are on a lattice, this is not true. You will, they will have to do an experiment that where they measure really that order parameter. Mm. Which this has not been done. Then the question is, of course, do, do we have an idea whether what they've done is actually essentially equally meaningful? Okay? And for this, we need to understand the gauge theory origin of what they are. Mm. Okay? I see. So it does not directly translate? From no, 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 it does not directly translate. At all. Actually, we know of counterexamples. <laughs> it's not published, but we know of counterexamples. Okay. Where you have one decay in one spa space, space is one decay, and space-time is another decay. Cool. 
Sorry for this parenthesis. Okay. So, so what is the origin of spill liquid? And uh, the reason why this was particularly controversial, in my opinion, is that uh, in this uh, paper where the, the, the DMRG actually they pointed this out, okay? that the, in principle what you have, in, uh, if you try to do a strong coupling theory of these models, you have a, a what is called U1 gauge theory plus X on the Kagome, where the magnetic field is zero. But it is known for ver from very old works, also by Vickery, Prokofiev, blah, 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 that when you have a phase diagram of such what are so-called U1 X theories, the deconfined phase is only present in a very small region of parameter space. But the parameter space that you identified in the experiment was very far and was definitely not in the regime of deconfinement. So somehow it's not clear if one thinks about the gauge theory that were proposed before to describe these experiments, whether this is actually a spin liquid or not. Okay? One cannot determine that. Uh, and what we did, ooh, okay, no, this I cannot show you now. So is it okay if we anticipate a bit the break and then we do this later? Because now I there are a couple of slides which are a bit heavy. Or we can tunnel through these slides. You believe what I said? And uh, yes, that's the, we can do so do like this. Okay, let me tell you the story. Then if you're interested in the computation, then we do it later. So what we did is the following. We wrote a generalized version of their model. So essentially, it's a model that lives on the ruby lattice, where we have R core bosons, B. So you can imagine that B plus B dagger is a sigma x. And then we have put a lot of interactions. Okay? We have a sigma x. We have also tunneling as plus as minus. We have put sigma z. We have put the next nearest neighbors, sigma z, sigma z, next to next nearest neighbor. And there is always the blockade. Okay? Nearest neighbor is always blockaded. And then we said, OK, let us add other Hamiltonians to this. Okay? So this is a mess, a messy Hamiltonian. Uh, on, on this lattice, and these are the various coefficients, uh, V2, V1, V3, which will be coefficients that depend on W. Okay? There will be spin exchange, sigma x, and then some interactions. Okay? Now, what we found out is that actually you can try to have an Hilbert space mapping of this type of system directly into something which is a gauge theory. Okay? And the idea is the following. You can look at what are the possible... Okay, let me... Let me draw a Kagome lattice here. Okay. You can take the triangles of your Kagome and look at what are the possible states of these three Rydberg, the three atoms. The number of states is not infinite. I mean, either you have no Rydberg atom, or you have one reader atom, reader atom here, or here, or here. So there are only po four possible states. And then we, we said the following. I will map these states into something which is actually a quantum dimer model, so something which I have either a dimer or no dimer, but I do it in a very weird manner. If there are no atoms, I map it in, into an equal weight superposition of all possible dimer or no dimer. Then if I put an atom here, I do the same equal weight superposition, but I change the state of the dimer corresponding to this. So instead of having three dimers here, I have two dimers, and this is empty, corresponding to the atom. And instead of having three empty, three empty dimers here, I have two empty dimers and one dimer corresponding to this. This mapping is one to one. It's a bit unnatural because it's off diagonal, but you can do it trivially. Okay? Then, if you map the Rydberg configurations into the configuration of this new model, okay, which is story code type, it turns out that you have configurations of this type. Okay? This is one sample. Now, a configuration of this type, now uh, let me analyze them very naively. You should, if you want to see whether there are conserved charges, you have to look at vertices. Now, if you look at vertices, you see in this vertex there is one red leg. This is three. This says three, this says three, this says one, one. So most vertices have odd number of dimers touching them. But then there are a few exceptions, you see? There are vertices like this, or vertices like this, that I either have two or four. Okay? 
So if I have to guess a Gauss law here, now we are guessing it, is that the allowed states either have odd number of dimers or they have an even number of dimers plus one particle. Okay, electron and positron is the same. Let's just call it E. This seems to be a Gauss law that is for free. <laughs> what type of Gauss law is here? It's not a conservation of a particle number. It's a conservation of a parity. So this theory, this Hilbert, this Hilbert space looks like the Hilbert space of a Z2 theory with matter, Z2 plus X. And we are seeing this just based on the mapping of the silver space, okay? We, are, we have not done, written down any formula, written down any Gauss law. Okay? And I will not be doing it, okay? okay? These are the charges, okay? Uh, and this is what I just told you now, okay? Number of dimers per vertex is odd. If the number is even, a gauge charge is present. Tuck, tuck. Blackboard, we have done our job. Then... It comes the Hamiltonian mapping. It's a bit of a mess because the Hamiltonian already before was five lines. And this is even more complicated. <laughs> okay, this is the Hamiltonian that we get. It's something where we have term that apply that applies a Gauss law on the vertices, and there will be plaquette terms on the triangles, plaquette terms on the hexagons, external fields, and also other diagonal terms. This is the Hamiltonian corresponding to a Z2 gauge theory plus X. Okay. So we can really write down the correspondence one to one. I'm not, I'm not gonna show you this, okay? I'm just telling you this is working, okay? So in which phase is this gauge theory in the experiments? This is a question that we can ask, okay? Have they really realized, I mean, now we have a model which can have a speed liquid, this is two plus X, and we understand where they are. I mean, we, by doing the precise mapping between the microscopic parameters, and, and, uh, and the Rydberg model, it turns out that the gauge theory has a J1 equal to infinity in the experiment and J2 equal to zero. Okay? But J1 equal to infinity is good because it implies it's a very strong magnetic field. If, and if one does the, the math right, we can actually find out a, a point in parameter space where the ground state of our gauge theory is an exact resonating valence bond state, which is a form of, of spill liquids, which is very... Uh, very easy to understand. And in principle, what we can do, let me just do one other, one other, uh, one other slide. Is we, we can move from this exactly soluble point, which is not exactly the one that is described by Rydberg, and study the extent of these quantum spill liquid states in this model. And what we found out is that if you try to move from one state to the other, you always, uh, for instance, here I think you have to move from zero to 0.3, you never really change phase, okay? The, 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 this is quantity is called Peter's susceptibility, near, really not, not, does not diverge, which implies that you have adiabatic continuity along these lines, okay? And in principle, okay, another thing we can do, let me say, ta -ta -ta -ta, is the spectroscopy, okay? We can try to, to check through uh, effectively a micro Monte Carlo simulation, simulation that the gauge theory corresponding to the experiment is really in a deconfined phase. I mean, I'm not going to discuss this in detail. If, uh, if you're interested, we can discuss this over a coffee break. But I think what is important out of this discussion is that these experiments realize a the gauge theory. The gauge theory is Z2 plus X. And in the experiments, they are in the parameter regime, or at least very close, to the regime where this gauge theory gets deconfined, so it does have a quantum spill liquid ground state. Which is topological in origin, by the way. Okay, so it's a very specific form of, of quantum spill liquid. Okay. Uh, so that's okay. I'm done with the Rydberg part. I'm sorry that I fleshed out this last thing, but I think you didn't want to see four lines equations for too long. Okay. So, but I hope that the message has been delivered, and it's a good time to take questions and pause if there are any.
So according to the simulations, does the experiment also have a finite density of matter? Can, can you pinpoint that the, the, ex, the experiment seeing like a finite density or it's very close to a toric code like ground state which it don't, does not have a density of any or something like that? Okay, it does have a finite density. But uh, if you want, the, the excitation of the matter are gapped. So it's, uh, if, you, if, you were, if you were to look at the correlation function between the x fields, this would be exponentially decaying. That, that would be what they, also, they would observe if they measure it. So I'm not sure if I understood correctly uh, this fidelity susceptibility uh, mm -hmm. analysis. Yes. Do you have a fixed state and then you see how is the overlap to this or? No, what we do is the following. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We this take line. different cuts along the phase diagram. These are the different values of H. H is a parameter, okay? Uh, and we see when you enter in and out of this P-liquid phase. So for instance, if you see H equal to op H over W equal to 0.5, this yellow line, that is at some point a transition around 0.4. Okay? But these transitions are not even related to spill liquids. They are something else. Okay? Well, this first one is related to spill liquid, but the rest is something else. If you, take, if you move along this line at h equal to 0, which was this black one here. Okay? I don't know what's happening. This, you see, is not changing for quite some time. Okay? Until, until, actually, you see, this is actually 0.1. Eh? Oh, Zero is actually changing only very far, which implies that between zero and 0.3, there is a very large spill liquid phase. Okay. Then, when we, well, after doing the exact analysis, actually we realized that along that line, we could do also very efficient uh, Monte Carlo simulations, and then we verified this. We, we did it for systems of around 10,000 spins, so this, we are sure about that. Okay. And this adiabatic continuity is important because then, essentially, you move on this axis, this is not where the experiment is. This is where we have exact solution. Then we prove that when the where the experiment is, is connected, is adiabatically connected to this exact solution. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. More questions? OK, so we are going to have a photo shoot. Ah, OK. So Tiago will uh, guide us for to take a photo. Okay. So just remain here for a few minutes, okay. for a few seconds. Okay. Uh, 